you. Thanks for the introduction. Can you hear me well? No complaints. Very good. Uh, so yeah, just one slide about me. I'm Luisa. Um, thanks for the introduction. It was already said most of these things. I just finished my PhD after five years. Um, um, and I'm quite excited to be here and talk about meta reinforcement learning, uh, which I'm still super excited about, even after I was spending five years nonstop on it. Um, and I've been to two summer schools myself early in my PhD, and I really like them, so I hope I can give some of that back to you today. And uh, yeah, next week, next Tuesday, I'm starting a job at uh, DeepMind in London in the RL team. So that's about me. And I wanted to start today with a little quiz. I asked Dali too, which I recently got access to, um, to paint a machine learning summer school in Italy, once um, in the style of Sandro Botticelli. <laughs> You can see these things here. And one's in the style of Giovanni Bellini. And so now this is your training data. And now here's your test image. And maybe by a show of hands, who thinks this is in the style of Sandro Botticelli? Okay, quite a few hands. And who thinks it's the second style, Giovanni Bellini? Nobody. Awesome. Well, those who said it's the first one, that's exactly correct, and you're really amazing few shot learners, is what you showed us now. Um, I'll have another example, which is more reinforcement learning, -y, less uh, few shot image classification. So imagine you're this agent, um, A, and you're in the middle of the circle, and the task is to a simple navigation task. I want you to go to a goal. But I'm not going to tell you where the goal is, you have to learn that. You, I'll just tell you it's somewhere on the circle. And you have several episodes, however long it takes, and each episode is roughly 30 steps long. And this environment, like, it takes about 10 steps to get to the edge of the circle. So that's roughly how you can, uh, how much time you have to spend. And every time you hit the goal, I'm going to give you 10 euros. And the goal stays the same. Every episode is the same goal. You just have to go there. It's simple. You can make a lot of money. So maybe if you think about this now, put your finger in the air. How would you explore this environment? You start in the middle, and then what? You go to the circle? Yeah, exactly. Simple, right? So here's how I would do it. Um, just have my PhD, so I'm pretty good at stuff. Episode one, you just go to the circle, walk along it. Oh, no, I didn't find it. I was reset. I just do it again, but this time I start where I ended last time, because I know it's not in the first part. And then once I find it, I can just go back and get my 10 euros again and again and again. Great. So the thing I'm trying to illustrate here is that humans are really good at learning things, right? And we do that by using previous knowledge or skills that we have, experience. We also know like how we personally learn very well. Like some of you today might be taking a lot of notes. Others prefer to listen because you know what your learning style is. And You've been learning a lot about reinforcement learning, and RL agents learn a little bit differently than humans. So if you look at this again, um, an RL agent would do something like this in the first episode, right? It just randomly jitters around, probably walks really far to the side somewhere, and then you train it for a while using your favorite RL algorithm, and after 500 episodes, it roughly knows the direction and where to go, but it's still pretty noisy. And then at some point, so I actually tested this using a PPO. It takes about 3,000 episodes to, to train this to convergence, such that it actually goes to that goal. And that's not necessarily a problem. This is just how RL works. And it can be good enough to give us like really cool, cool results, right? So for example, in 2016, uh, we mastered the game of Go, which a few years previous to that, we were thinking, like, this is going to take 20, 30 years more. Or we're never going to be able to solve this at all. Um, Doina was already talking about the, the weather balloons. And also in robotics, we made a lot of progress using reinforcement learning, where robots can, like, manipulate objects. They can solve Rubik's cubes. It's all pretty cool. And well, the way we did this is, of course, with a lot of time compute. Reinforcement learning takes really long. The AlphaGo, the original AlphaGo algorithm, was trained on like 100,000 human games and millions of self-play games. 
to get to this level where it's at. And so reinforcement learning does really well if we have that time, if we have really good simulators, like for the, uh, when I mentioned it, for the balloon navigation, they had a pretty good simulator to train it on, or if we have a controllable environment, like in robotics labs, the robots are in the lab, we have a red button that we can push, they can't run away, um, and there's a human usually looking that nothing is going wrong. Um, but of course, it would be nice if we could also use reinforcement learning for even more re real world things, like I don't want to do my dishes alone, it would be great if I had a robot that just did it for me, right? So why are we not here yet? And the reason, I have a few RL challenges that I think are keeping us, of course, go ahead. Like this? Is this better? Thanks. If something wrong, tell me again, I'll adjust. Okay. So first of all, I already mentioned this reinforcement learning, the training takes really long, right? Mm. Here's an, Sure. Um, here's a plot from a multi agent RL paper. It doesn't really matter what's on there, but on the x axis, you see it's billions of steps. It's billions of environment interactions, which is a lot. Um, then, in this paper, they trained robots first in simulation, then in, they tested them in real world environments. And the paper is really cool because they managed to, like, sort of train that agent in just three days, but with the equivalent of 80 years of human experience, just to get a robot to navigate somewhere. So again, that would take really long if you wanted to do that actually in the real world. The other thing is, of course, reinforcement learning, it came up earlier already, produces over-specialized agents, which is sometimes exactly what we want. Like in Go, we want it to be extremely good at Go, and we don't care if it's good at mopping my floor. Uh, but in other scenarios like self-driving cars, we don't really want the car to over-specialize to one neighborhood. And as soon as we drive out of it, it's like, I don't know what to do anymore. Or even different cities, right? Um, and then lastly, reinforcement learning, if we train it from scratch, it usually starts with a random policy. Uh, this one's not random, but if you've ever seen like a robot simulator and trained RL, this is usually how they look at the beginning. They just fall down. Um, and so all of these things are sort of keeping us from deploying reinforcement learning algorithms in real world setting where there's much more noise and like random things happening on a daily basis. And so in order to get to these settings and actually safely deploy agents there, we need our algorithms that can learn or adapt to new things much, much faster than they currently do. Like if I bring my robot home, I can't wait 80 years for it to figure out how to navigate my house. It should do that maybe in like two hours, right? Um, so the question is, how do we get there? One thing we can do, of course, is just sit down, think a bit harder, and develop new algorithms. And this is happening, and there's a lot of pretty good progress here. There's another way to do it, and that is to just use machine learning to learn how to learn. Um, instead of making these RL algorithms ourselves, we use machine learning algorithms to learn reinforcement learning algorithms. And that's basically uh, what my talk is going to be about. This is roughly what I'm trying to talk about. In the first part, we're going to talk about what is meta reinforcement learning in the first place. I'll give you a few intuitions and definitions. And when do we want to use meta reinforcement learning? And then in the second part, we're going to look more closely at some actual algorithms. I'll present in detail MAML and R squared because they're super fundamental. If you understand those, you can probably understand all the follow-up meta reinforcement learning papers because they more or less build on ideas that were used in those algorithms. And I'll give some more recent examples and some quite exciting stuff that came out in the last few years. Okay. Um, what is meta reinforcement learning? I have three ways of giving you an intuition of what that is. The first one is by using this um, quote by Matt Botvinnik, where he says, reinforcement learning is slow partially because it has a weak inductive bias. And an inductive bias is just any prior knowledge or assumptions that the RL algorithm uses. And partially this is a good thing because it means we can use RL algorithms for all kinds of things. They start out from scratch, so we can train it on self-driving cars and the game of Go. But also it means 
learning takes pretty long. And so meta-reinforcement learning can be seen as a way to learn inductive biases from data. An inductive bias would be, for example, if I drop an object, it falls to the floor. Like humans, for, that, for us, that's just a thing, that's normal. But a robot has to learn that. And ideally, when I bring my household robot home, it already knows about gravity and doesn't like, learn that with like dropping my stuff all over the house. Okay, so that's one way to build, like, think about meta-reinforcement learning. Another is, um, if you think about the RL training loop, so here we have this agent, and it learns by attempting to solve a task, then it gets evaluated, it gets some feedback in forms of reward, and it learns from that feedback, and it gets better over time. Always by trying to solve the task, getting feedback, getting better. Now, meta-reinforcement learning, you can see it as doing this, but then on a meta level. So you first attempt the act of learning, then you look at how good you were at learning, and then you get better at learning over time. And you can do it over different types of games here, for example. And then at the end, you're just extremely good at learning. You can do it faster, you can do it better, and so on. Okay, and then the third intuition is sort of when we think about how to develop our algorithms, we sit down, we're like, oh, there's this agent, it interacts with the world, and there's thousands of things we can think about or have to keep in mind. As exploration, you heard about it now. Generalization, we, maybe we use a value function. We need to do credit assignment. We need to tune hyperparameters, all these things. And in principle, you can come and say, oh, I'm not going to tune the hyperparameters myself. I'm going to meta-learn how to do that. So I, in principle, you can take any part of an R algorithm and just replace it by a meta-learned part. Um, okay, so now that you have hopefully some idea of where I'm getting at, we're going to actually put this into a bit more formal framework. All right, so first we're going to write down an RL algorithm as a function that just, just maps data to a policy. Okay, so F is our algorithm, um, D is all the data we've collected so far until step I, so everything the agent has seen. Um, pi is the learned policy, and it has some parameters, uh, phi, i, which are given by f. So often f just outputs the parameters, but basically it's for the policy. And we, we just assume we use that policy also to collect the data. All right, now we're going to parameterize f with some meta-parameters theta. And we don't have to parameterize the whole thing. As I said, you can just take one component, like the hyperparameters, and um, set that as your meta parameters, but you can also learn the entire thing. You just learn a big neural network, data in, policy out, and it does some black, black box magic stuff, and we're happy. Um, yeah, as I said, could be anything, whatever you want. Um, then we have to define a meta training distribution. So now we actually have to learn F. We have to somehow optimize theta to give us a good learning algorithm. And usually we have just a training distribution over MDPs. And the thing that changes from MDP to MDP is usually the reward or the transition function. Um, if you think about back to this, this example, here, if I wanted to meta train my agent to be really good at this, I would make a distribution that looks roughly like this, where I sometimes just put the goal in other places. And I keep uh, like dropping my agent in there and have it learn uh, one of those tasks. So here the reward function changes because the point where you get a reward is different every time. Okay, and the inductive bias it could learn from this is like basic navigation, how to explore, that there is a goal on the circle. And so all these things are kind of things we can meta learn. And then once we deploy that agent, all it has to do is learn about where the goal is. It already has like meta learned all the inductive biases that are necessary to solve these type of tasks. All right, and then lastly, we of course need a, a meta objective. So let's look at this for a second. Um, do you see my, yes. Okay, so here we have a distribution over MDPs. So during meta training, we're just gonna sample a batch of MDPs and let our agent roll out on each of them. Then here, these are just the transition dynamics of the current MDP. Here we want to maximize, of course, the reward given our current policy that's given by RF, right? And maybe one note on the indexing. So here I, I index it from e, I equals K to H plus. So H plus is basically our 
meta learning horizon. Like how, how much time do we give the policy to learn the current task? You could say you get 10 episodes for, for the previous one, and after 10 episodes, I want you to have figured out the task. But we can also set this to 3,000 episodes, or if, if we want to learn like over a whole lifetime of a nation, we can also do that. And the little I here, the reason that it starts at K is that sometimes you want to give the, the agent some time to explore freely. It can make a lot of mistakes in that time. They don't count towards its final performance. So we, like, sometimes you just want the agent to be good at the end, not necessarily already in the first episode. <laughs> Good question. I, I kind of just omitted that here. Usually no, because, well, that's not true. Depending on how big H is. Like in, in my own research, I usually just set the discount to one because H is relatively small. I have like three episodes, I don't need it. But if it's much longer, then yeah, you should add a discount factor. Thanks. It's also tricky because then you, like, where do you start discounting? It's not, it's not so straightforward because the I starts at K. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> so let's ignore that for now. But yeah, if you actually implement it, you have to think about it. Okay, and just some uh, notational things. Usually people call this, uh, when you update theta, they call this the outer loop or the meta update. And when you update phi, you call that the inner loop. So if you, if you look at this uh, picture again, here at the top, we just have the inner loop. So we update our policy using the, the learned learning um, algorithm. And then during meta training in the outer loop, you update theta. And at meta test time, all you do is you use your learning algorithm to perform one inner loop. And you have an algorithm that's pretty good at learn. All right, so far so good. Uh, any questions maybe about this? Thanks. So you um, have a, after you went through all the environments, you used the final algorithm to test them all, or? Um, you, you usually, well, yeah, it depends on what your training distribution is. Like in the, in the example with the goal circle, if you want to evaluate, you just sample like, I don't know, 100 goals and take the average or something. Because right. um, we don't always have a discrete distribution of, of environments. Sometimes we have infinite many, and then we just take a sample. Um, but yeah, depends on what you're interested in. Thanks. And also during meta training, we resample some of these environments, right? We have like, in Atari, we have whatever, 50 games. Uh, so I would like resample every, every meta update step. I just take a random sample from my training distribution. So I might see them again and again. Um, so in a way, my agent really overfits to the training distribution, right? Instead of specializing to a single task, now it specializes to this training distribution. But it's still specialized to, in this case, Atari games. Um, which, by the way, doesn't really work because there's not enough. But um, so far, nobody really has met all trained on uh, Atari games. All right. Is there another question? Yeah, hi. Uh is this, okay, hey, uh, I'm having a bit of a hard time differentiating meta-learning to the standard kind of controller, meta-controller, or teacher-student relationship that you often see in re like standard reinforcement learning. So I was wondering if you could just kind of, right. is there like a fit, th like a proper line you could draw between the two? Um, I also sometimes have a hard time doing that, so there's not a hard line I can draw, but I think the main um, difference is that you have sort of this bi-level structure in meta learning where the, the outer thing, the, the meta agent, really tries to get better at learning. So there has to be some measure of learning progress and that you're optimizing for. Whereas if you have a more of a hierarchical thing, um, usually both the, the upper and the lower agents try to sort of solve the same task. Whereas here you want the base agent solve the particular task that it currently has, but the meta, meta agent is not solving any task. It's getting better at learning. So it's sort of a bit of a shift, but like the, the type of techniques you might be using could be quite similar. Thanks. Okay. Is there another question? Right. Then uh, let's talk about what and when to meta learn. So what can we meta learn? I already said it, you can basically meta learn anything. 
Um, you, whatever you're currently struggling with, just try MetaLearn. Um, on a more serious note, people have actually tried to MetaLearn quite a few things. I just listed a few here for your reference if you want to uh, look into any of this or if you have a different thing, just Google it. Probably somebody has tried it. Um, my research, my PhD work, research was mostly on exploration. So some of these uh, papers here are mine. Uh, yeah, but you can meta learn really anything. And I'll come back to some of these examples. I'll tell you in detail what they have actually done. Um, maybe a more interesting question is when to meta learn, because that's not super straightforward. And I tried here to sort of separate out different problem settings where you might want to use meta learning. Uh, the first one is few-shot learning, the thing that we did at the beginning of, of the lecture. So here you really want to learn new tasks very quickly within just a handful of episodes. This is something our standard RL algorithms absolutely can't do, like the deep RL algorithms. And so we can use meta-learning here to get solutions that are very domain-specific. So they're going to have a pretty strong inductive bias on like the task distribution that we have given the agent. It can navigate to a goal now, but it can probably not play Go. As a matter of fact, it's probably going to, if you wanted to train it on Go, you're probably better off training a new policy from scratch, not the meta-trained one. And a special case here, just to mention it, is like zero-shot learning, where the K that you saw earlier is just zero. So we, we drop the agent somewhere. Like if you send a robot to Mars, you can't really let it explore for a day, like falling down cliffs and everything, it has to perform good from the very first step that it takes on Mars. So that's called zero shot. Um, okay, another setting is the many shot setting. So here, we actually wanna find algorithms that we can use like for whatever, billions of steps, right? So here, we really wanna find algorithms that are better than standard RL, and where you would compare to a standard RL algorithm. So can we find an update rule that's better than PPO or DDPG or, or things like that? And the solutions here, usually what people want are general purpose. So they're not, the idea is to not overfit to a task distribution that much, but really have a general purpose algorithm. And then the last thing I want to mention is single task settings. So here we don't have a task distribution at all. We have one task and we, we sort of use our standard reinforcement learning algorithm, but now we want to meta-learn alongside and kind of make it better over time. So we just improve our learning performance a little bit over time. And I'll give an example about this um, much later. But these are not all settings where you want to, might want to use meta-learning. You can use it in continual learning settings, multi-agent settings, whatever you want, but the literature mostly focuses around these three um, settings. Okay, I have some, some pictures again, um, if that's your thing. So here, few shot, the, the green bar here is sort of where we let the agent explore freely. It can break all my bases, I don't mind. But then at the end, in the pink part, we, it has to perform well. It should be able to solve the task. And in the zero shot case, it's a bit different. It has to explore very carefully um, to maximize the reward that it gets through all of this learning phase. Many shot is the same, it's longer. And you would think you can just use the same algorithms, but in practice, because it's so much longer, usually the same algorithms don't really work. And I'll, I'll tell you why later. And then lastly, in single task, you more or less do the same thing, but now you don't have different tasks, you just have a sliding window over which you, you get better. So you learn for a bit, then you look at, oh, how good was I actually at improving? And then you try to be better at learning in the, in the next window that you're, that you're looking at. Right, is that questions? Um, I have a question here, how we can compare like, for example, meta learning to, and yeah, to mixture of models when we, when we learn like mixture of experts? Mixture, wait, sorry, say again? How yeah, we can compare for example, machine yeah, learning? Uh, we have meta learning where we try to learn like uh, high level like uh, policy and low level policies and we have mixture of experts when we learn like specialized like policies and getting network to select policies and this one so when we use or how to compare between them like when when would you use a, a meta learn agent and when would you use a mixture yeah of experts? and just like yeah practically what's like the 
how do, how to compare both of them? Yeah, the use case. That's a good question. I, so I guess it again depends on the setting you're in. Like if you're in the few shot uh, setting and you have a bunch of experts, that might be a viable viable alternative um, to use compared to an agent that adapts uh, itself. Maybe not so easy in these, but really the the idea in meta learning goes a little bit beyond that because in the mixture of experts, you have experts on like a fixed set of tasks maybe, but in meta learning, we want the agent to eventually just learn new things on its own where we can't really predict what kind of new tasks it's gonna run into. So if I just, I, I can't really like pre-train all the experts because I don't, can't predict what the agent's gonna like face in everyday life or what's, when it's driving around town, you see? Okay, we can talk about it later, come to me. Maybe I didn't get your question. Um, one thing, sorry, I'm a bit confused. So if you cannot pre-train the task, you go with the few shot or the zero shot, right? Um, yeah, well, okay, yeah. In the few shot setting, we do assume that we have access to the tasks for, for meta training. That is true. Yeah, so that's why like the, the mixture of expert might be like a good alternative in the few shot setting, because you assume you have access to the training distribution, and you also assume that the ta tasks that you get at test time are from that distribution, and that there's not gonna be suddenly a completely new thing. Like in the circle example, if at test time my goal is suddenly outside of that circle, well, all bets are off. Like the few shot alg algorithm is not gonna be able to solve that. Yeah, so in that case, we could, we could pre-train. And there's also some work that used like pre-trained experts to sort of, um, to use that during meta training to make the, the meta training a little bit easier. So if you have those experts, you can even use them for meta training your agent. Yeah. All right. Um, so now we get to part two. And now I can also tell you that the first part is gonna about the, be about the few shot setting and then I'm gonna talk about the many shot and the single task settings later. And the idea here is to give you a bit of an overview of what people have been up to. And Marmel and RL squared, as I said, are, are really fundamental algorithms. And if you understand them, then many of the concepts that are in those algorithms are gonna reappear over and over again in, in other algorithms. All right, so few shot meta RL, just to reiterate, is the, the thing that most papers have been written on. And here we have these two settings. We have the few shot setting where you give the agent some time and we have the zero shot setting. And typically what people do here is they meta learn a policy. So I told you you can meta learn anything, hyperparameters, um, I don't know how to sample from a replay buffer. But in this setting, usually what people do is just learn a, a policy, so policy parameters. Um, and that policy can then adapt quite fast. And usually the, the key point here in few shot meta learning is that the agent has to explore really, really well because it doesn't have that much time. That is less of a problem in the many shot setting, but here it's like super critical. Um, okay, so let's talk about MAML. The idea in MAML, um, this is a paper from Chelsea Finn from, and, and colleagues from 2017, and the main idea is that you learn a policy, policy initialization. So phi zero, right? And so the idea is that when I have this phi zero, I get a new task, I just have to do one or two gradient updates and um, I'm done. So that's the idea, that's the goal that we wanna um, go for. And essentially this is similar to, to fine tuning. So um, you like envision this is often done, you pre-train uh, like an image extractor on ImageNet and then you can fine tune it on your particular task. Um, right, so if we wanna like squeeze that into our previous definition, then you could say that the reinforcement learning algorithm that we're using is reinforce. Um, that's what the MAML paper did. Just now we use a learned initialization. Usually reinforce starts with a random initialization. You take your deep neural network, randomize the weights, you start learning. Here, the idea is we still use reinforce, but now we're uh, using a learned initialization. So our meta parameters are these in initial parameters. And in the inner loop, we just start with phi zero. We use reinforce to update, use one to five gradient steps usually, and then the policy uh, has solved the task. All right, um, let's look at some actual math. So here, this is the inner loop update. So in the inner loop, for every task in our current batch, I'm gonna index this with J, 
we're updating phi zero, our initialization, to some phi one on that task uh, by just doing a policy gradient update. In, in this case, they used reinforce. And so then in the outer loop now, we are going to update our phi zero, the thing that we started out with here, by, okay, let's go through this uh, one by one. So here we take the gradient with respect to phi zero, right? And here we have an average over all the tasks we have seen in the inner loop, so a batch of, say, 25 tasks. And then we look at how good is the policy after I've updated it with my inner loop, right? So this is the, this is the performance of phi one per task. But now we're taking the gradient with respect to phi zero. So phi zero is like stuck in here because it actually is, is here, right? So we're taking a gradient through that update. And you're actually gonna get higher order gradients because if you push this gradient operator in here, then here you, you have another one, so you're gonna get second order gradients, right? So the idea is we have an update that is differentiable in, in those initial parameters. We're just gonna push that um, gradient update through that inner loop. And if you implement this in PyTorch, it's quite nice because you can just use auto diff tools to like do all the math for you. You just literally take a gradient with respect to phi zero here and it will like take that gradient for you. And that thing is called a meta gradient and meta gradients occur like all over um, meta reinforcement learning and also in, in other fields. Um, So good, I'll skip this one. I'll, I'll show you what it can do, maybe. Okay, so here is a training distribution, seemingly simple. You have two tasks in your training distribution um, where you want this cheetah to sometimes run to the left and sometimes to the right. So the reward in one task is just like the velocity in the correct direction. And so you meta train it only on these two tasks and then at meta test time, you pick one of the tasks. You don't tell it which one it is in, but it can infer that from the on the reward. All right, and because I don't have uh, videos from Amamo, I'm gonna show a video from my own paper. But Kavya, so Kavya is my own work, but it's basically just um, like an extension of Mamo, um, like so many papers out there. So the, the, the behavior of the agent is pretty similar. Okay, so on the left you have phi zero, which hasn't learned anything, right? That's our meta-learned initialization. And so the task is to walk right, but since we didn't do an update yet, it just like wiggles around a bit randomly and um, collects data for the update. So now we did an update, we get phi one, and it just, well, more or less successfully runs to the right. <laughs> this is maybe not one of my best seeds. Okay, you, you get the idea. Like, we do one gradient update, one gradient update, and uh, it solves the task. And you can do the same for the other direction. And that's, that's, that's the idea. And that's pretty cool. You can, you can do, like, more interesting things than just a distribution of two tasks. Um, but, yeah. Okay, to, to wrap Mamo up, uh, yes. So the main technique here is you, that they use is metagradients, and um, that's something good to keep in mind. Metagradient is just like a gradient of a gradient where usually you somehow parameterize the update such that it's differentiable um, and you backpropagate through it. And you, you can do other things than the initialization. You can do, for example, your hyperparameters um, or yeah, other things, your exploration parameters, anything. And maybe a side note, actually, I said you can just do, let autodiff do the thing. It's not quite right because um, the, your meta gradient might be biased and there's a lot of research on how to actually get the right meta gradients. But usually in practice, you saw it, you're just fine with the autodiff tools. And um, if you're interested, you can check out those papers. All right, let's take a break and think about Mammal. Any questions about Mammal? Yeah. Oh. Uh, it, is there empirical work that studies like how good meta learning uh, performs if the, the the tasks in the 
yeah, meta tasks start getting further and further apart. So basically, let's say I have tasks of running and tasks of swimming. Mm -hmm. Is there still a benefit to using meta learning? I, I think so, but um, yeah, like yeah. it probably deteriorates with the further it's apart. Yeah, great question. You're right at the edge of like the research there. Um, People have tried, of course, and I said at the beginning, like Atari only has 48 tasks and they're quite different, so people haven't successfully meta-trained anything there. And it, in my own experience, I've tried different uh, of these Mujoku tasks, like the little robot that you saw. It gets pretty quickly pretty bad. Um, so I, I think there's still an advantage to using meta-learning, but there's this weird thing where um, if you have a small training distribution, you're fine. If you, if you have like, let's say, three discrete tasks, then you're in an area where it's maybe a bit weird. But then at some point, if you have enough tasks, if you train on all the tasks there possibly could be, great, if you manage to actually train that. Um, I don't recall any papers that like specifically look into it, but it's definitely something people are interested in and are trying at the moment. Um, there's one benchmark I'll mention at the end. It's called Meta World. Is it called Meta World? Yeah. Um, where they have a fixed set of training tasks and f fixed set of test tasks. And the training tasks are like, oh, put a, it's, a, it's a robot hand and it has to like open a cupboard, put a ball through a net. So they're quite different. They're, it's quite multimodal. Um, and the algorithms work reasonably well, like the ones we have. And there's more specialized ones for that benchmark, but yeah, you'd have to look that up. Any more questions about MAMO? Yeah, about MAMO, I, I was just wondering uh, why did they use reinforce? Just as a simple beginning, or was there a special reason not to use any? Mm, that's a good question. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. I would guess just as a like a simple yeah beginning. It's it's you could use a different thing. Yeah. Um, Is there follow up work with other algorithms or? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, you also have to make sure that everything is nicely differentiable, which isn't really like necessarily the case for all algorithms. Um, so maybe that, that's one reason. Uh, but yeah, not sure. When you will use meta-learning and when you will use curriculum learning? Mm. Um, so curriculum learning is where you like, yeah, start with like simpler tasks and then slowly get, they get harder over time, right? Um, so if, if you wanted to train just a multitask agent, um, which is where you want one agent to be able to solve all the tasks at once and not forget about something, then curriculum learning is like uh, quite nice um, to sort of do that slowly, slowly over time. But you could also combine curriculum learning with meta learning. Like maybe you wanna start meta learning with the easier tasks first and then uh, become harder over the time. So, they're, they're, you, yeah, so what I mean? Um, don't know if anybody has really, well, probably people have looked into this, um, but yeah, thanks. Okay. Right, then let's look at RL squared. Uh, so there's actually two papers that basically came up with the same algorithm at the same time in 2016. And um, the consensus is everyone calls it RL squared, but what they mean is really these two papers. The other one is called learning to reinforce and learn um, group, but we just only use one abbreviation usually to refer to both. Okay, and so the, the main idea is you use a recurrent neural network. I hope, uh, it's, I'll have a picture of an architecture if you don't know what a recurrent neural network is. But you use an RNN for the policy and you give it access to its previous actions and its, the previous rewards that it got. And so basically, by having access to that, it can learn from all the input that's coming. It can see like, oh, when I did this action, I got this reward, so probably I should keep doing that, right? And th this is an algorithm that can do the, the few shot, uh, sorry, the zero shot setting, because you just, you just roll it out in an environment. It would walk around, see all these things, get all these inputs, rewards, and it can sort of adapt on the fly. You don't have to do gradient updates. So all you do is roll out the RNN. It is a pretty old idea to use sort of RNNs uh, for meta learning, but now it's, it's here it's been used in the RL setting. And maybe it's easiest, oh, okay, let's skip this. Maybe it's easiest to, to understand it if you look at the architecture. 
So here you have your policy pi, um, and usually your policy only gets as input the state and it outputs an action, right? But now we make it recurrent, so it has this hidden state that where it can sort of save things that it thinks it's important and that hidden state gets fed into the policy um, after every time step. And it also has access to its previous actions that it took and, and the rewards that it got. And so the, the, the parameters of the RNN are meta-learned. So at meta test time, all you do is, is you roll out your RNN, and in the RNN, because it has this hidden state, it can sort of do learning. It can like update its hidden state, what, whatever that like means. It could store information there in the, oh, I'll, I'll show you in a second, but in the, in the goal setting, it could remember, oh, I've already been there, so the goal is not there, so I should check out that other area. So learning really only happens within the, within the RNN. There's no gradient updates. And that's why it can happen on the fly. Every new input the agent gets, it learns something. And yeah, as I said, R squared can actually learn to solve this. So you, you put the agent in there, and it starts walking along. And in the hidden state, it remembers where it has been. And it has meta-learned to explore this efficiently. And so something that, if I, if I train this from scratch, it takes 500,000 environment steps or 3,000 episodes. Um, now RL squared can solve this in just 100 steps by exploring very efficiently and then just remembering where the goal is. Um, again, I have a video okay, that's going to have to load for a second. Are there questions maybe while we wait for this fantastic video? Good. Um, again, this is a video from myself because I don't, well, I don't have access to R squared videos. Um, very bad is an algorithm also based on, on R squared, just a little bit, um, yeah, different architecture, different loss. But okay, so here is episode one. The first time this agent is dropped into this environment and the, the task is to run left, right? This is what it does. It just runs left. You basically, you don't even see that it's learning at the beginning. It takes like maybe three steps, which you, you can't see, it like it sees I took the step. Oh, the reward was actually like either negative or positive, so I have to run in that direction. Like it's instant. It's amazing. <laughs> um, and this is called some. This this is called Bayes optimal behavior. If you want to read more about this, um, check out maybe these papers. Um, but yeah, so the, the the idea, the kind of takeaway here. This is a different way of meta learning. The first one was sort of gradient based. You do you do updates in the inner loop. Here, what you do is you, you learn with a recurrent network, and the learning only happens within the RNN. And the nice thing here is that it can adapt online. Um, so if I take my household robot home, I don't have to supervise it for the first day because I can trust that it explores relatively safely and uh, doesn't yeah, do, or do any bad things in my home. All right. Question. Hi. Uh, so for meta learning, uh, gradient based meta learning, uh, you have kind of uh, some guarantees that you uh, can converge to something, right? Uh, but what a, this is kind of more black box uh, because you have uh, an RNN. Yeah. Uh, in your work or any other work, do you have any possible uh, theoretical guarantees no. on something <laughs> or no? Okay. So yes, you have theoretical guarantees in the gradient-based stuff, but also only under like pretty strict assumptions, right? So in practice, you do use like deep neural networks, all the assumptions are off. Um, so also all your guarantees are kind of off. Um, but you can usually expect that even if you're out of distribution, if you use MUML, if you just keep doing the updates, maybe eventually it will learn the new task. Um, which is not the case here, right? You just have the RNN. If you keep rolling it out and out and out, it's not going to learn anything that it hasn't seen during training. Um, so no, I don't think we have any like good guarantees for this. Um, there's some, uh, read the papers from Pedro Ortega, there's some nice um, theoretical things in there, but convergence guarantees are kind of, yeah, difficult. Sorry, follow up. Uh, so, because I, I, um, uh, I was about to ask this, but um, 
So what do you mean by out of distribution in this case? Do you mean that it's a completely different task that, that you had never seen during uh, the meta training phase? Yeah. So, yeah. so it, uh, for this kind of algorithm, you don't have any possibility to, to work on uh, out of distribution? So, I mean, you could, if you know that you're out of distribution. So first of all, out of distribution is kind of a mm, yeah, hand wavy term, right? For the, if you have to circle with the goals and the goal is just a little bit outside, you're just a little bit out of distribution. But if you're suddenly you want to learn chess, you're quite far out of the distribution. Yeah. There's no real like consensus on how to measure these things. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is if, if you are out of distribution and you know, then you could just start updating those status any, again, right? Um, so you can always do that uh, because that's essentially what Mammal would also do. It just updates the whole thing and cross fingers that it learns. Um, we have done some experiments where we actually tested how, how far out of distribution can we go and it's not that far. Um, so we tested the, the circle and basically we trained it on, on one half of the circle and then we put the goal on the other side. And it takes forever to sort of um, recover from that inductive bias that it should go left. And it's actually better to just train a new agent from scratch. Don't use your meta-trained agent. Sure, it has learned to navigate and things, but it like has the completely wrong inductive bias. I don't think it would change anything, but I don't know. We'll try. Um, and that we tested by just updating the thetas again. So we took both mammal and arrow squared, just update everything, see what happens. And yeah, sometimes they don't recover at all. Um, and so, yeah, there really needs to be some work done on these, like even slightly out of distribution tasks. How do I get the agent to explore again? How do I get the agent to know that, oh, something's different. I haven't found the goal anywhere on the circle, so maybe I should start looking elsewhere. Um, that's something our algorithms currently can't really do. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Two minutes, good on time. Um, right, let's dive into some more examples. And I'll keep these shorter than R squared and MAML because now you know the basics and um, you can go read the papers if, if you're really interested in some of them. Okay, many shot. Meta RL, basically the same as before, except that we don't have a few episodes, but we have many, many episodes, right? And as I said, the goal here is usually to learn more general purpose RL algorithms. And in theory, we can use the same, but if you actually think about it, like in MAMO, we do these gradient, like these, these yeah, gradient updates in the inner loop. If we now did hundreds or thousands of those, we can't really back propagate through all of them. It just doesn't work. Uh, same for RL squared. If we roll out the RNN for you know, 10,000 steps, then you can't really backpropagate through that. So that's a problem, and that's why we need different methods for these types of settings. Um, okay, here's just a, a few papers if you're interested in these kind of things uh, that you can check out. So people have done pretty cool stuff here, and I will show you one paper that I that I find amazing. Okay, and it's called Discovering RL Algorithms. So it's already from 2020, but it still amazes me. Um, so the method is called learn policy gradients. And the idea here is what their meta learning is an update function, easy enough. And so this maybe looks similar to some of the updates you've seen in the earlier lectures. It doesn't really matter what the details are. The point here is you have a meta network, the LPG network, and the meta network outputs your targets. So both for the policy so this influences like how the actions get adjusted. And for this, um, well, it, usually what you would have over here is like a value target, right? You estimate um, what your value function should be and then you try to get closer. This is just a vector that your meta network outputs. It doesn't really have any semantic meaning. Um, they have some uh, experiments where they look into like what has actually been meta learned. Is it close to a value function? So check those out. But really, like, there's, there's nothing in here anymore that tells um, you that you have to maximize the reward, right? The LPG network, the meta network, has to tell uh, the agent how to do the update. And it's kind of <laughs> crazy to me that this works at all, right? At the beginning, L the LPG network is just going to put out gibberish. How are we learning anything at all? But they managed to train this um, with some like, regularization and so on. There are some things you have to do to make this work. 
but they actually trained this um, on yeah, full lifetimes of agents. So let's not get into the details of how this was done. Let's look at the results because those are the, the cool things. So what they did was they trained this on a bunch of uh, grid worlds. So they came up with a whole suit of different grid worlds, different kind of tasks you have to solve in the different grid worlds, a lot of them, and they trained this update rule. And then they take their learned update rule and they evaluated it on Atari, something like it has never seen before during training. And so here in this figure, you see on the, on the bottom axis, on the x-axis, you have the number of training environments, so the number of grid walls that it used. And here is um, sort of the number of games where we're better than humans. It's like how people evaluate Atari games. And here's different RL algorithms that humans have come up with. Right, so you might have heard of DQN, that's a pretty famous one. And so here's how LPG does as you introduce more environments. And it's like, I mean, it doesn't get as good as Rainbow, sure, but this is kind of amazing that this works at all. And this is like the, the, one of the first papers that does this, right? If we spin this further, you can imagine in a couple of years, maybe we're much better than Rainbow. We're gonna like really find new RL algorithms that we ourselves couldn't come up with but that we just use machine learning and big data on to, to discover entirely new algorithms. And so this is why I think this paper is super cool and that direction of research is super cool. But it's young and um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening there that, that is currently being developed. Um, are these uh, RL algorithms uh, that the uh, discovering algorithm came up are kind of uh, interpretable somehow, yeah? Um, a, a little bit. So as I said, they tried to like look a little bit into what this uh, the semantics of this output uh, that the LPG network does, and it has some like similarity to what the value function would predict. Um, so you can yeah you have to put some effort in. You can make them a little bit interpretable. Um, this one is nice because you still, like, they still put, left some structure into the update rule, right? The more black box you make it, um, the less interpretable it's going to get. And there's some work, I think here, the, from Lewis Kirsch. He's really trying to uh, train these completely black box algorithms where data in, policy out, and then it gets much more harder to interpret it. Um, but they could potentially be more powerful as well. Like, they don't have to rely on gradient updates, like the, they can come up with their own update rule. You just give them parameters and they update them somehow. Yeah. But yeah, that's always like, I'll get to it at the end, I think, but it's always a choice you have to make when you decide what to meta learn, like how much structure am I gonna put in, how much, like, yeah, or am I gonna go completely black box, which is harder to train, but potentially more powerful. All right, uh, single task. At RL, unless there are no no more questions on the multitask. No, too amazed to speak. I understand. All right, single task. Um, as I said before, the goal here is to accelerate the standard RL um, algorithm that you might be using on a single task on the fly. So you're while you're learning, you're learning to learn, and then you get better over time. And it happens across these sliding windows. And again, I have some pointers here. If you're interested in, check out these papers. People have tried to sort of learn intrinsic rewards on the side or auxiliary tasks or even the objective functions. Uh, you can like blend in the objective function. You like start out with your own and you slowly go to a meta-learned one. And I will show you two papers, I think. Um, one is on learning to explore. So. Uh, I think DDPG was mentioned in, in Amy's talk earlier, but so basically what these people did, they, they took a normal R algorithm, DDPG, and DDPG usually doesn't explore in like the super smartest way, it just adds noise to the output of the policy. And it doesn't have to be random at every moment, you can like make that a little bit smarter, but basically what it is, it's adding noise to the output. So this paper was like, well, what if we just don't do that and we meta learn how to explore? Can we get better? And so they tried three different versions. The first version is where they only learn what noise is added. So instead of doing Gaussian noise, they have a network that outputs the noise added. 
Um, and in the other two versions, they actually learn a completely separate policy. So you have your GDPG policy that learns how to um, act optimally, and then you have your exploration policy that's only trained to explore and like get better at learning. And um, they did this uh, like once in a standard way, and then here they added algorithmic states as inputs. So for example, what are the current Q values, or how much did I improve my learning in the last bit? So there's all kinds of things you can add to inform your meta learner um, how to adjust the exploration. And one interesting, interesting bit here is that they actually didn't use meta gradients or anything. They used a reinforcement learner on top. So now you have like the inner reinforcement learner, and now you're learning how to explore on the meta level also with an RL algorithm. And the, that RL agent is going to get as a reward the increase of the return of the base agent. Make sense? Read the paper if, if you want to know the details, but it's pretty cool. So you train RL on top of RL. And here's a graph from the, from the paper. So here at the bottom you have GDPG. And then these three lines are basically their um, algorithm where you use GDPG plus the meta-learned exploration. And it's better. And again, quite cool that you can do this. And the question again becomes, what parts should we meta-learn? When should we meta-learn them? Why not do this all the time? You know. um, one other paper that I wanted to mention for the single task things is uh, this. This is an uh, algorithm called StackX. And it basically, um, again, on the fly, learns how to set the hyperparameters and some auxiliary tasks. And this uses meta gradients. So again, meta gradients uh, come up everywhere. And just to show you that it works, basically, the, the dashed lines here are the baselines, and then the solid lines are um, their algorithm where they meta learned these things on the side. And I wanted to put this graph as well. So this, this graph basically tells you um, here on the, well, y-axis, which hyperparameters um, they meta-learned. And you can sort of see a trend that the more you meta-learn, the better you get, um, according to this figure in this paper. I'm sure there is a limit at some point um, where this breaks down, but it's kind of cool that, uh, yeah, this, this works. And they managed to like meta-learn so many hyperparameters. Um, all right. Questions? Otherwise, I'll talk about open research. Cool. Um, all right. This is just like my personal opinion. Um, but I think some of the things that we should be working on, first of all, always benchmarks. Uh, we never have enough benchmarks, and that's something I struggled with in my PhD a lot, um, that I didn't have the right tasks to show that my algorithm is the best. Um, so a lot of times in meta-learning, you have to like make your own distribution, or you use ones where you're basically already maxed out. Um, so there's these Mujoku tasks, for example. We're now too good at them. Like We can't really use them as, a, uh, as they are. You can make them harder again, of course. But then every paper like oh says, oh, we're making them sparse now in this way. And then you can't compare papers anymore. So we need new benchmarks. And there's luckily in the last few years, a bit too late for me, but there came some uh, cool, cool benchmarks out. Meta World I already mentioned, um, where they have this simulator of a robot arm. And the cool thing here is that you have a clear training task and test task split. So Meta World really wants to test how good can you transfer or generalize your meta train policies. Um, then there's Alchemy, where you have to like mix portions and you really have to do hypothesis testing and and like yeah ch check how, what things to mix to get the best portion. Um, and then there's NetHack, which is interesting because it's procedurally generated, generated just like Alchemy. So you really get a new task every single time. Um, and so the hope here is that because of that, it, it, it learns a bit more of a general um, thing, meta -learn, whatever it's meta-learning. Right, so benchmarks uh, is the one thing. And then another th big thing is we, it came up a couple of times already uh, to really deal with um, distribution shifts between training and testing. Our current algorithms don't really work that well, so I, I mentioned it. I, we did some tests. Uh, here, check out Zeng's paper for that, um, where basically even with a small shift, the meta-learning just doesn't give you anything. 
Um, but it should, right? Like, we kind of hoping if my agent already learned how to walk to the left, it should be quite easy to learn to walk to the right. The question is, how do you do it? Um, how do you get it to explore again? So we need algorithms that can tackle this stuff. And then this is just a, I put some other things on here. Um, one big thing, I think, is how do we more efficiently make use of data across tasks? Like right now, um, meta training is quite wasteful, let's say. Like sometimes I had to wait a week for my experiments to finish. So it takes forever because you're not doing RL on a single task. Now you're doing meta RL on all these tasks. So there must be a way to better use data across tasks. And people are already doing this, for example, by taking one trajectory and then relabeling the rewards according to a different environment. So they assume they know the structure of the reward function and then they can just use one trajectory but then like manually label it for different tasks after. So that's one way. Um, this also came up already um, where we maybe it's gonna be useful to quantify somehow how similar tasks are um, or to quantify like how far out of distribution are we, how much do we have to continue adapting. Um, one big thing at the moment is also using offline data or expert data during meta training. Again, this can make meta training much faster um, because you don't have to do all the simulations. And in the long horizon, in, in the many shot stuff, I already mentioned it, um, the optimization issues are still there, right? I said we have to do something else. People still use meta gradients, but then they just truncate that entire lifetime into like smaller parts. There's still um, some improvements that you can make there to really train an agent over an entire lifetime. Okay. Um, yes. This um, I've mentioned a few times already also. I told you you can basically meta learn anything, whatever you want, just go and try it. Um, but there is the question of, well, what's actually worth it and what isn't, right? Um, I personally think that exploration is one really useful thing. Did I put that here? Missed it. Well, exploration, the most important one, which is not on here. Um, according to, I, I think it's one of the like big open questions in RL, right? How to explore efficiently. It's like, we're not at a point yet where we have super, super good exploration policies, and maybe that's why we should start looking into using meta-learning to discover these things. Um, and not just in the few-shot learning, but really in the many-shot learning to discover entirely new um, exploration policies. And a, a side note on this, apart from thinking about what to meta-learn, we also have to think about what are useful features for learning. Like, if I tune my hyperparameters, I sort of I look at the curves and I I do some thinking and then I adjust my hyperparameters. What kind of information do we have to give the meta learner to make optimal decisions for learning? Um, like it needs probably access maybe to the learning curve in some sense, like what are the deltas, how, how steep are we, so that it can see, oh, I'm stagnating, maybe I should start exploring again. Um, so in any project, this, this came up again and again, like what kind of features do we have to use? Um, Okay, this is just a, me being excited about MetaRL. Um, I think MetaRL is like one of the coolest uh, research topics out there because we can actually train agents that can learn on their own in an intelligent way, more like humans learn, right? And not entirely from scratch. And I think it's cool because eventually that's gonna be one important piece of deploying RL agents in the real world. It's not the answer to everything and it has to be done together with like integrating language models and vision models, but um, still I think it's gonna be a critical, like it's a no-brainer. Agents have to adapt if they're in the real world. Um, and the other thing, particularly the, the many-shot case, the general meta-learning, I think is really cool because just like out of curiosity, I wanna know like what kind of things can machine learning can come up with that we haven't come up with and how much better can we get. Um, and it's not gonna only make things better for real world applications, but it's also gonna make our lives easier because then our, um, our algorithms don't take three days to run on a toy experiment. Um, but yeah, we can, we can uh, be much better. And on the note of interpretability, if we can make them interpretable, then we, we can actually also learn from these things, which I think would be amazing. All right. Uh, before we get to the questions, here's the questions that I often get asked. 
Um, so don't we, we don't have to do anything anymore. Are we just replacing ourselves? Great. Our job is done. Um, of course not. So here is what I think is you have to do if you want to develop a meta R algorithm. So previously, the inductive bias was sort of in the, in the algorithm itself, but now we're putting the inductive bias sort of in the meta R algorithm. We still have to design them, right? Um, so if we actually want to go home and try this, then the first thing you have to do is what do you want to meta learn? You have to think about this. Um, pick exploration, for example, a good one. And then you have to think about how do I parameterize the problem? It's um, do I want to like learn the hyperparameters that influence exploration? Do I want to learn a full policy? It's not, like not super straightforward always how to parameterize this problem. How do I do a loss function? Do I give it structure? Do I make it a black box? And then of course you have to choose what kind of setting you, you want this to be in. Do I want to over specialize to one training distribution? Do I want a general algorithm? And do I want single versus multitask? So all the things we saw. And then you need to think about, well, now I need an objective, right? I didn't really talk about objectives so much because I didn't have time to get into it, but there's different things you can go for. Like if you train an agent for one billion steps, do I want it to be really good at the end? Or do I want the area under the curve to be high? And want, do I want it to learn as fast as possible? And there's different choices for this and, and they have different consequences for your algorithm. And then you have to optimize it somehow, right? I mentioned meta gradients and briefly RL, but there's many ways you can optimize an objective and people have also tried evolution strategies. Um, Cause the, the nice thing about evolution is that you can actually just run the thing for an entire lifetime, evaluate it and then like pick the best ones and go again. It's just, it takes a bit of time, um, but it doesn't have the problems of meta gradients that you can't like back propagate through the entire thing. And then you of course need a training distribution. And I think that's, the most important thing in all of this is what is your training distribution? Because that's where everything is coming from that your meta RL algorithm is learning. All the inductive bias is gonna come from this. If I say I wanna meta learn an exploration policy, well, what kind of exploration do I wanna do? Deep exploration, like depth first, breadth first, like what, I don't know. And I, I need to find the right environments to like get the kind of exploration behavior that I want. Um, I can't just train it on all possible environments because that's, that's not going to be what I want. So I really, these need to be like very, yeah, specific choices that you have to make. You have to think about this because um, everything your agent can do at the end depends on your training distribution. All right. Um, thanks. And now we have some time, I think, five minutes or so for questions.